So for this video, we'll be talking a bit about Rust launch files, which is quite a, a really nice feature to, to have access to. Um, what we have uh, seen thus far is we want to start a Rust core, then start a few nodes and let them interact with each other. And that becomes tedious if you want to set up the same thing multiple times. And this is actually what you often want to do with a robot, where you have multiple systems that should talk together and so on. And Rust Launch is a tool for setting up multiple Rust nodes and including their parameters. And we want to take a look at how to actually specify that. The files consist of an XML document and is saved in a file with uh, the surname uh, .launch. And when you run a launch file, it can be done through the rust launch command. You can either specify the file name directly or specify the package in which the, the file name or the launch file uh, resides. Then when the rust launch command is uh, issued, if no Rust course running right now, one is started, and then it goes through the list and or goes through the launch file and figures out okay which packages to start and with what parameters and so on. And quite many things can be be done in this way. So the structure of this uh, launch file is uh, given up here. Um, we have a root element that is this. Uh, bracket launch, bracket end, um, and then bracket um, slash launch, bracket end, uh, structure that encapsulates the, the entire launch file. And inside this uh, launch element, you can have uh, multiple nodes that where they are identified with a name, the package they come from, and the name of the executable that should be run from within that package. And it's also possible to set some um, additional par parameters uh, here. For instance, where to put uh, the output from the, the program, should that be presented on the screen, on the terminal, uh, which the screen means, or should it be put in a log file? Yes. And then let's look at some practical things that could be considered for, for doing this. Here we have a, a few frames of a video sequence of a person uh, throwing some kind of frisbee a disc. It's um, hard to see the exact colors here, but it has a, a magenta color and uh, starting here and then thrown in, in this direction, in this location, and then here. and finally up here. So if we want to track an object like this in an image and we only have limited processing power available, then it makes no sense to actually investigate the entire image to look for, for this frisbee. Um, and we can actually utilize this uh, information to focus our search on whatever region is uh, making sense to, to look into. Um, so try to think about whether we actually need to search the entire image for the frisbee for every frame. Um, and if it's possible to limit this thing for a, a certain case, then what information sources can we use to actually limit uh, this uh, search area we, we want to consider? Take a moment to, to think about this. Some ideas for this is to look into the current position of the frisbee. If we have detected it in, in one frame, then we would expect it to be quite close to that position in the next frame. We could also estimate the current speed of the object or its movement vector and use that in combination with the current position to predict where it will be in the next frame. We could use information about the time between images to see, okay, I saw 
this image at this time. Two seconds later, the object was here, and two seconds later, again, the object was in, in a new position. Or we might even have information about a, a likely uh, starting position of an object. If it always starts in the same position and then moves from, from there, we could also employ that kind of information for initializing the, the system. So let's see how we in practice can uh, attempt to, to predict the next pose uh, of an object on the next uh, position of it. If we look into uh, some some kinematics, uh, there are a few uh, equations here, but uh, let's try to, to draw them and see if we can uh, make sense of it. So um, for 1D kinematics, Um, um, I'll to take a look here. If we want to describe where we'll be uh, at the current time step k, we can look into where we were in the previous time step plus the velocity and the x direction multiplied with the time difference between uh, step k mi minus 1 to step k and this will give us uh, the prediction. We can also rearrange this so we get an expression for the velocity at a certain uh, time. If we take this part subtract from over here then we have x k minus x k minus 1 divide that with the difference in time and we get an estimate of the current velocity. So that's one way of, of estimating the, the velocity if we have a, a sequence of, of uh, positions. Um, and if we then know this position, we can actually predict okay, where will we be uh, in the next time instant, because then we will see if we can detect or estimate the location of uh, x to the k plus one frame where we only have observations from uh, the, the earlier frames. So we have this x k frame, that's the current frame we have information from. And then we need to plus and then use the, the time position here. That would again be x k minus x, sorry, x k minus one divided by the, the change in time between these two. Um, I can write it here. It's, so it's between k and k minus 1 and then multiplied with the time between uh, k plus 1 and k. Um, if we have a steady stream of um, images then these two uh, time differences will cancel out and we could uh, simplify it to to the following. So xk plus xk minus xk minus 1 or 2 times xk minus uh, xk minus 1. Um, so, so far so good. We can also do this in um, in a vector format where we um, introduce what is known as a state space uh, model where we both have the position and the velocity um, and the position actually I might want to uh, use a p for that in, instead of x. Um, I think it will make it, it a bit more clear what I want to achieve afterwards. Um, and now the idea is if we have this uh, both our position and velocity vector at k plus 1 and we want to or we want to predict the value here at k plus 1 then we have the value here at, uh, at k. We can multiply it with that with uh, a matrix. 
and see okay how does these uh, things uh, add up and uh, the position should be multiplied with a one the velocity should be multiplied with a one should have a zero down here and what should be up here is our uh, change in, in time between uh, the case and the case plus one uh, observation um, if we multiply this out we'll have that the position at k plus one is equal the, to the position at k not plus one just position at time k plus the velocity at the case frame times the time step which is actually what we have seen, seen before and within this model we don't assume that the velocity uh, changes so the velocity at k plus one is the same as the velocity at, at uh, times at k the nice thing about this is that this can actually uh, be generalized so if we have a motion in two dimensions we want to track both x and y we can set it up so we have the position in x and we have the velocity in x we have the position in y and we have the velocity in y then that this is also a state vector and to predict where this is we still need the the same uh, input vector here with px and vx and py and vy at time step k and then multiply it with now we have a 4 by 4 matrix and again the the x values interact with each other and the y values interact but the remaining parts will just be zeros so we'll have something like this where we have the, the same structure as before that determines how we should predict the position and velocity in the x direction based on the position and velocity in the x direction and the rest of the values here means that to predict the x and the x position and x velocity we don't rely on the uh, position and velocity in the y direction and similarly in the to, to predict the y position and velocity we don't uh, utilize the the x position and velocity oh sorry I was a bit too fast here and drew uh, a zero too many. So this will be uh, two uh, motion um, tracked uh, independently. Uh, using the, the same model. So this is what can be be written here. Oh, we are off by a k plus one or a k minus one. So if we want to design a Rust node that is able to track such a frisbee, uh, it would be beneficial to consider which parameters should uh, the Rust node take as input. Um, that can define how it operates. That could be the color of the frisbee, uh, or its apparent size, or something like that. It should also have information about which input topics it should listen for, and where it should put its uh, output topics, and what type of um, image or data that should be published on, on these uh, topics. Should we output an image? Or should we output a position in an image, or a text string describing where it is in an image, and, and so on? Good. Now we reach the end of, of the lecture. I hope you learned something through this way. See you.